Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Hi, I'm going to talk about the burden of proof again. Um, I got a comment in my, my previous video about the burden of proof, uh, which said that, okay, the burden of proof is not a law of logic, but it is a logical fallacy. And, um, uh, no it isn't. Um, and I'm not going to belabor this, because I, I don't think it needs to be belabored, especially after you know, the points I made you know, the, the more important points I made in my previous video. But I'm going to talk about this a little bit just because I find this idea so funny. And I hope you will too. Okay, so I pulled up yourlogicalfallacyis.com and uh, went, went to the burden of proof page there. So I'm going to read this to you. Um, and uh, it's, so piece by piece. Okay, so the burden of proof. So, so their, their summary is, you said that the burden of proof lies not with the person making the claim, but with someone else to disprove. <clears throat> and, and I will say, uh, so far, that um, this is actually criticizing somebody invoking a burden of proof. Now, as I mentioned, just, just for summary, the thing is, there is not, as a general rule in life, such thing as a burden of proof that necessarily falls on somebody. The burden of proof, really, what it's trying to get at is the fact that if you can't force somebody to do something, you have to persuade them to. Um, so if you want somebody to believe something for some reason, and you can't make them, then you have to persuade them to it. And that's true. Uh, on the other hand, it has nothing to do with what is true, or even especially what can be known to be true. Um, which is what logical fall- I mean, well, okay, so there are two types of logical fallacies, really quickly. Formal fallacies, which are form- um, fallacies of inference. That is to say, they are forms of reasoning that simply don't work like the fallacy of affirming the consequent. P implies Q, Q, therefore P. Uh, to give a, a simple example, if Socrates is a bull, then Socrates has feet. Socrates has feet, therefore Socrates is a bull. Doesn't work. It, and it, the form of it doesn't work. It can't work. It doesn't... Now, uh, because something is a fallacy, it does not mean that the conclusion is false. It just means that you can't get from those premises to that conclusion. Um, now, the other type are informal fallacies, which aren't fallacious reasoning, they are, well, there isn't a really great definition of them. They are basically things that at least sometimes are not true. In formal logic, they're basically valid arguments which have premises that are at least fairly often false. You, um, so in the burden of proof, right? Um, if you say that uh, the burden of proof lies not with the person making the claim, but with someone else to disprove. Now, a really simple example. Take anybody who, who drones on about the burden of proof. You know, how you've got the burden of proof, I don't have it. Okay, fine. Then, you know, ask them, you know, does France exist? And they say yes. And then you say, prove it. And they won't. They never do. They'll just say you're an idiot. I've done this a bunch of times. It's pretty much reliable. They never prove this. I mean, you can, as, as my friend Eve likes to point out, if you just use the principle of retortion, that is to say, applying a philosophical principle to itself, the person just claimed that you have the burden of proof. Well, according to their principle, they have to prove this now. And, and she goes and invites people, and then they call her idiots. It, it's, um, it's amazingly predictable how this goes. Uh, uh, and I think I'm recovering old ground, covering old ground that I already covered. But you know, then there are people who will like sprinkle on the magic fairy dust of saying this isn't the burden of proof is not a claim. It, it's well, you know a law of logic, etc. Okay, fine. Now what this is criticizing here is, by the way, one person trying to assign the burden of proof to someone else, saying, okay, go ahead and disprove it. But on the other hand. This is how people do normally operate in quite a lot of circumstances. If a person says, you know, hi, my name is John, and another says, where's your, another person says, where's your evidence? Nine times out of ten, especially on the internet, the answer you'll tend to get is, why would I lie about that? That is to say, they're saying the burden of proof is on you to prove that my name isn't John. Um, and, and you see this all over the place. It is incredibly common, actually, that there are a lot of things that are simply accepted, and that the person saying them does not have to, therefore, you know, it does not have to prove. And in fact, the other person has to take up some burden in order to show that it isn't true. Again, you know, France is the example. Somebody mentions that the French language exists, you, you know, and you say, okay, well, that's a claim. And it is, clearly. I mean, if you claim that France exists, but, you know, everyone knows that France exists. 
let's not get into the, the deeper thing about, well, on testimony, etc. I'm not talking about skeptics right now. And um, so the, uh, so, so it's something that happens actually all the time and is generally accepted. And most everybody, if you actually try to apply the principle that the person making a claim has to prove it, um, you, you would just, it, it wouldn't work. I mean, in, in normal social human interaction would simply fail. It, it wouldn't work at all. Um, okay, let me continue. The burden of proof lies with someone who is making a claim and not upon anyone else to disprove, as noted except when it doesn't. The inability or disinclination to disprove a claim does not render that claim valid. Okay, now, hang a step. There's no such thing as a valid versus an invalid claim. I mean, the only thing, the only, you know, you can have an invalid argument, which is to say an argument whose form doesn't actually work, where the conclusion does not necessarily follow from the premises. That's an invalid argument, but a claim is a premise. There's no such thing as an invalid premise. I mean, the closest you could come to having a coherent definition for what an invalid claim is would be roughly um, something to the effect of like a claim that is not specified, like where you, you can't even tell what is being claimed. Like, if, you know, you might say that, like, Ognarb Snip Pinecone is in fact an invalid claim because no one can tell what on earth it even is as a claim. It, it kind of isn't anything, and so therefore it's not a claim, and so it's not a valid claim, you know, there's that. Or um, you, you can come up with other examples. You can't come up with a, so far as I could imagine, you can't come up with a non-ridiculous example of what an invalid claim could even be. Simply because claims are, in a logical argument, the premises. Um, or they can be the conclusions as well. I mean, you know, in a sense, you know, your claim is the conclusion of your argument if you're presenting an argument. But if you're not even presenting an argument, if you're just saying X is true, then the only way X could not be valid would be if it, you know, if you can't tell what it is. Okay, so, moving on. Okay, does not render that claim valid, nor give it any credence whatsoever. Okay, like, like in some sense, this is true if you weren't talking about human beings. But, you know, when you're actually talking about human beings, and this is a big problem on the internet, I will admit, a lot of people seem to have never met the things, uh, despite, in theory, actually being some of them. But, um, yeah, the uh, thing is, when a person makes a claim, everyone knows the only reason people do this is because they have some reason to believe this claim to be true. They're liars. But if somebody's not lying, they are advancing this for some actual reason. What that reason is, you know, that can vary. You know, and a lot of times it's because I got this from a reliable source. That source being, you know, my parents, the culture in general, and so on. But those are reasons to believe a thing, and they have a lot to do with the reasons why people who don't live in France believe in the existence of France, in fact. Um, and so... Like that, that's there's this odd sort of blindness, and I, and I think this may be one reason why people um, so often accuse uh, a lot of people on the atheist side of just being autistic because they just have so little of an understanding of how human beings work. I, I don't think that that's, I mean, okay, there are some studies which actually do show that autism may be particularly high amongst atheists, um, but in general, I don't think that this is you know a useful generalization, but I can see where it comes from because of things like this where people seem to know nothing whatever about human beings. So if a person says, I saw a, you know, I saw a red-tailed hawk, the reason they're claiming this to you has something to do with they have a reason to believe they saw a red-tailed hawk. They might be wrong. It might be a red-shouldered hawk. The two are easy to confuse. It might have been, you know, a crow. They saw a backlit, and so they didn't realize that the thing was black. You know, not because um, it was backlit, but because the thing's actually black. It, they... they there could be all sorts of reasons they might think they saw a red-tailed hawk, but aren't, you know, but were wrong. But they're telling you they saw the red-tailed hawk for some reason. Similarly, if a person tells you that there's such a country as France, it's for some reason. And then, you know, moving on to the less empirical, because, um, oh, it's amazing how incredibly hung up on empirical things some atheists get. Uh, but anyway, you know, moving on to the, to the less empirical things, you know, if somebody says that they heard a funny joke, 
Well, the reason they thought it was funny, you know, they're telling you that it's funny for some reason, having to do with them having thought it was funny. And no, you can't measure funny, especially because they're people who don't always laugh at funny things. Anyway, the the uh, the point of this being that um, the the very fact that a person is saying to you that is taking the trouble of putting their credibility on the line by making some sort of claim to you is evidence that they have some reason to believe in this. So there is some credence, I'm not saying a lot of credence, people claim false things all the time, but there is greater than zero credence given to something because a person took the trouble of telling you that it was true. They might be lying, they might be mistaken, etc. Some credence, greater than zero credence, is not the same thing as complete credence. It's not proved by any means. But on the flip side, if you assign it zero credence, you're basically just an idiot. Okay, getting back to this. However, it is important to note that we can never be certain of anything, and so we must assign value to any claim based on the, on the available evidence, and to dismiss something on the basis that it hasn't been proven beyond all doubt is also fallacious reasoning. So kudos to them, because that part's actually true. Now, they give an example. Bertrand declares that a teapot is, at this very moment, in orbit around the sun, between the Earth and Mars, and that because no one can prove him wrong, his claim is therefore a valid one. Well, again, of course it's a valid claim, because it's intelligible. It might be true or false, but you know what it means, and it's a claim. What else could validity mean about a claim? Um, yeah, and I think it is telling that they don't say, and that it is therefore true... They could. They could very easily have said his claim is therefore true. Would have taken fewer words, in fact. Uh, but no one says that. No one anywhere says, because you cannot disprove the thing I am claiming, it is therefore true. It's just not a sort of thing. Now what people will do, I will certainly admit, is say that there is a mass of human testimony about a thing, and if you cannot disprove it, well, you should take it to be true because there is this mass of human testimony about it. As in, tons and tons of people have, you know, inherited, inherited this information passed on, and moreover have lived it out and found it to be, to, to actually work well, you know, to be consonant with human life and so on. Because, I mean, plenty of things don't, if you try them. And, and so all of this is strong evidence that the thing is true, and since you've got no counter evidence, the weight of evidence is on the side of the thing being true. Now, they don't put it that clearly. I will certainly grant. Uh, some people do. <laughs> I've seen Eve, Eve Kinnainen more or less spell this argument out as, you know, a reasonably good one. Not a conclusive one, but reasonably good one. Um, so, I mean, you'll see that, but that's not in any sense fallacious reasoning. And uh, fun fact, when I first heard, you know, I'd heard about Russell's teapot a few times, and, and you know, whatever. Okay. But then I actually looked up the passage from which it came. Um, and Wikipedia actually has sort of two. It, it appeared in sort of more than one place. And when I read it out, I was just kind of struck. That it, it, was, it was kind of astonished at how utterly unrelated to Christianity it is. And moreover, Bertrand... And here's the thing. You know, some, some ignorant, you know, person who's not very smart on the internet hears about this, can't really understand it, can't really understand much of anything else, and so they apply the one to the other. You know... Not good, but it's not their fault. It's the fault of people who knew better, who should have taught them better than they in fact were taught. So, you know, in a sense, okay. Bertrand Russell was quite intelligent and quite well educated. And he absolutely should have known this had nothing whatever to do with Christianity and what he was talking. And in fact, I am confident he knew this had no relationship to Christianity whatever. Just to give a brief explanation for people somewhere in between those two. <coughs> Pardon. Um, the thing is, the teapot, which nobody can see, and therefore nobody could, you know, and there's a tremendous amount of space to look for and so on, and um, the, the teapot in the example he gave was something for which he had precisely no reason to believe that it existed there. He said, if I claimed this, not that he saw it, mind you, not that he saw it, no one else can see it because, you know, a, a teapot out there would be so dim and so on, and it wouldn't include anything you know, in the vast reaches of space, um, you know, you wouldn't be able to, to verify this claim, but had he claimed to have seen it, he'd have some reason to believe it existed. He specifically set it up um, 
the uh, he specifically set it up. Sorry, one second. Um, so that he had absolutely no reason to believe in this, which has nothing whatever to do with the testimony of people who interacted with someone who performed miracles. You have a reason to believe that somebody performed miracles when you saw those miracles. When somebody tells you, I saw miracles being performed, you have a reason to believe it. Human testimony. Most things we believe is on human testimony, by the way. Um, so I, I know there are people who will simply dismiss it, but everyone who dismisses human testimony in general does so entirely selectively. And in general, they're just not worth e even bothering with. Um, the, um, okay. The, um, which is not to say that all human testimony is therefore true. I, there, there are tons of idiots on the internet. We're, those of us who aren't idiots are all familiar with this. Anyway, so, um, when I read this though, given how clearly and obviously this was specifically designed in such a way as to have no relationship whatever to Christianity, and it was Christianity that Russell was specifically trying to, to address, and given that Russell was smart enough to know this and well-educated enough to know this, I realized that he had to have been lying. There's, there's no other possibility. You don't do this sort of thing as an intelligent, well-educated man unless you have some ulterior motive. And so I just sort of knew, and, and I'm explaining this out in words. In the moment, I just sort of had this, this, this direct knowledge. This is a bad man. And so... Out of curiosity to see if this intuition was in fact true, I, went, I just went to Wikipedia, looked up his biography, and hey, look, pretty quickly in, you get to where he left his wife in order to take up with his mistress. And then later, you know, divorced his first wife and then married his mistress, and then later he left his now, you know, second wife in order to take up with his mistress, and then later divorced her to marry his mistress, and, yep, big surprise, the man was a scoundrel. So, um, fun little side. It's just, it, that sort of thing doesn't happen very often. I, I just had this overwhelming sort of realization, this is a bad man, and well, he was. And, uh, and this is the thing, most atheists I don't think are, are into atheism because they want an excuse to be bad. That's not typically how people work. Usually people rationalize why they're bad. Like the reason, you know, the reason why I stole is because it was actually okay to steal, not because theft in general is fine. Um, uh... But, um, but, you know, because, like, this theft in this case wasn't really theft, it was okay. Like, that's how human psychology normally operates. Like, well, I was justified in cheating on my husband this time. Um, you know, that sort of thing. It's not like, well, you know, in general, you know, somebody who cheated will say, like, like a, you know, I know of a case where um, she's saying, like, well, my husband isn't giving me enough emotional intimacy, so I warned him if he doesn't start giving me the emotional intimacy I crave, I'm going to cheat on him. And then he didn't, so she went and cheated. And, you know, she was justified, so I've been told, both in her own mind and in other people's minds. Um, because, you know, first, because he wouldn't give her the emotional intimacy that she craved, and second, because she warned him, she gave him for fair warning, and he didn't change his ways. So therefore, this cheating was actually justified. That's how immorality tends to work. That's how it tends to be justified. Something specific. These are unusual cases. It doesn't tend to be marriage as an institution is completely, you know, non-binding and a married person is perfectly free to go and have sex with whomever they want at any time. It's just not how people work. Because, I mean, to, to a great degree, the whole reason you're bothering to justify your evil in the first place is because you want approval of someone, and you're not going to get that in general by trying to completely overthrow, you know, morality. You're just going to get people thinking that you're awful. So you have to be a lot more cunning and subtle. It's just sort of normal psychology. However, that's normal human psychology. The thing is, particularly intelligent people tend to be very strange and very unusual. And so, someone like Bertrand Russell is a lot more likely to go in the direction of attempting to overthrow all of morality, um, because they can sort of being they're sort of intelligent enough to try to pull off replacing it with an alternative system, and and making it all sound, um, you know, clever, and um, uh, you know, to, making it sound clever and making it sound. Um, you know, plausible, making it sound like they're, they're actually doing something else. They're, they're you know, replacing one system with another. They're not, you know, merely just overthrowing it to anarchy and so on. 
I'm, it's not true. I mean, that that's what they're actually doing. But they're smart enough to, to erect enough of a structure that it looks like this. Um, you know, the structure is self-contradictory and so on. But whatever. Okay. Um, so so that that's about Bertrand Russell. Um, and, and sort of, you know, the related thing that... Yeah, if a person literally had no reason whatever to believe something, um, you know, and, and, and bear in mind, what that looks like is, hey, uh, there's a um, um, unicorn on the Pope's hat. You believe it, right? No one does that. No one does anything like that. that that's... You know, that's the nature of comedy routines. You know, pulling stuff out of thin air that has nothing to do with your experience or anything like that. It's not something people do except to make other people laugh. It's not... It's it's not related to human life. Um, and consequently, thinking that people who believe things upon, say, testimony is people believing it for absolutely no reason is being a complete moron. Um, there, there are lots of complete morons it, see them show up in my comments, I see them on Twitter, and so on. I'm sure everyone has. Okay. So that that's sort of the problem. What they're describing as, as a logical fallacy is, for the most part, either not or inapplicable. Moreover, um, it, you know, it's, it's one of the strange things that if you just, um, you know, if, if you just thought out for a moment took this seriously, what would it actually look like? Where every time you have any sort of claim, you would have to prove it. You know, suppose this is in fact the rule. Oh, I'm sorry, there's one other thing, which I won't get into, but um, all claims are always convertible into negative claims. I mean, for the simple reason that P is equal to not not P. Um, so, you know, to claim that something is true is the same thing as to claim that it's not f false. And, um, you know, to give a trivial example, to claim that the prime numbers are infinite is the same thing as to claim that there is no largest prime number. So you can either make this as a positive claim or as a negative claim, and that is in general true. Positive claims are almost invariably convertible into negative claims, and negative claims are generally convertible into positive claims. Um, you know, to take a simple example, um, to, to, you know, to say that something might be false is to say that the, it is possible for the alternative to be true kind of inherently. Um, so, you know, um, you know, to, to, I'm sorry, I, I can give examples, but it's it just, in general, and then I'll get back to the point, the point I was on rather than another digression, um, anything which you are claiming might be false, you are claiming it is, po that the universe exists in such a way that it is possible for this thing to actually, for the alternative to be true. So, for example, Oh, shit, I said I wouldn't give it... What the heck? Um, okay, there's only one prime triple. Uh, prime triple is, is a number where the... Um, uh, three, five, and seven are prime triple. Triple. They're, they're three consecutive uh, odd prime numbers is a prime triple. They're, they're, as far as we can tell, they're probably an infinite number of twin primes. I don't believe that's been proved. Um, but no one's ever been able to, to find a largest. And it looks a lot like there should be an infinite number of twin primes. That's two primes separated by two. Um, which gets especially interesting given that you can construct arbitrarily large prime deserts. That is to say, um, um, s sequences of numbers of arbit you know, you can construct of arbitrary length where not a single one of those numbers is prime. Um, it's just whatever factorial plus one plus two plus three plus four, or, um, etc. Um, uh, I'm sorry, plus two plus three plus four, etc. Like that's a string of, you know, prime numbers, etc. Because, you know, with the factorial, etc. Anyway, uh, e common, e each one of those becomes a, has a common multiplier with a whatever factorial. Um, anyhow, so, uh, but tri prime triplets, it's, it's relatively straightforward to prove that if you had um, three primes separated by three in a row, uh, that one of them has to be divisible by three. And so the only prime triple you can have is, um, is the one that actually includes three. Okay. Um, so, uh, and I, I hope... That's not overly technical here. I apologize, and you know I have a degree in math. Anyway, so the point is that um, if you know a person claims that, um, uh, um, sorry. So the point is 
Okay, if somebody claims that uh, there are finitely many prime numbers, I'm sorry, finitely many prime triples, and the other person says, well, you have to prove it, they're sort of implicitly claiming that it is possible for there to be infinitely many prime triples. So it's, it's not the greatest example, I will admit. Um, I, I came off it, up with it off the top of my head, so I, I apologize. I should have had a better example. Um, but, um, for example, um, uh, well, okay, you know, suppose that a person is touching somebody, and, you know, so, um, you say that, like, I'm touching his shoulder, and, uh, and then say, therefore his shoulder is touching me, and a person says, well, can you prove that his shoulder is touching you? The thing is, they are saying, they are implicitly claiming there is some sort of possible universe in which you can be touching them in which they are not also touching you, which doesn't work. It's not the sort of thing for which you would need to give any sort of proof for the very simple reason that the alternative universe can't exist. Um, so it's, you know, and a reasonable retort is, well, how could it be possible for me to be touching his shoulder without his shoulder also touching me? Now, um, the thing is, because it can't be, the person is claiming, well, maybe this impossibility could be true. That's essentially what's going on there. Um, it's related to why a lot of people w will, you know, in the face of doubting claims, say, well, okay, that just makes you an idiot. Because, well, in a lot of cases it does. Especially simple cases. Alright, but given all of that, given that, just suppose for a moment there was somebody who actually tried to live out the burden of proof. That any time they make a claim, they have to then prove this claim. Okay, how exactly are they going to ever prove anything? Because pretty much the problem you have is that you're going to hit an infinite recursion problem the first time you try this. So, you know, let's say that, that you try to prove something. Okay, so, um... Uh... Water makes things wet. You know, pouring water on something will make it wet. Well, okay, I'll prove it, because, you know, in the definition of water, uh, the definition of wet is containing water, and if you pour water onto something, uh, or containing or, or having on top of it water. Um, and so, if you pour water on something, there will be water there, and therefore it will, by definition, be wet. Aha! But you have claimed that the definition of water, uh, of being wet, is having water on it. So now you have to prove that. And so you go. Like, like you can't stop, because every time you do anything, you are going to be having some sort of claim, because the nature of any sort of argument is you start from something and you go to somewhere else. But if, the moment you assert that anything is true, you have to then prove it, any time you started an argument, you'd have to pause, then go back and prove that thing. But you'd have started from someplace else, you'd have to pause and go back and prove that thing. And so on, if you tried to live this out, if you tried to actually live out the burden of proof, you would immediately just hit a recursion problem. Where you will never, ever prove anything, because you will never get into your argument, because you will always be backing up and starting to establish how to prove the thing that you need in order to prove the thing, etc. So it's kind of an interesting case in which the only way a person can possibly believe this is by never, ever having tried it never once having tried to actually live this out consistently. Um, so it, it's, I find that, and, and I apologize, I'm really, really far into this with digressions before I got to the punchline. Um, I, I'm terrible with digressions, I apologize. I'll, someday I'll, I'll be better about this sort of thing. I also haven't gotten a lot of sleep lately, which makes life harder as well. Anyhow, so the point is, if you actually tried to live this, if you actually tried to ha have the burden of proof beyond the person making the claim, you would actually hit an infinite recursion the moment you tried to do it. I, I mean, it, this isn't even retortion. This isn't applying a thing to itself. Forget that. Let's let's give you a free pass on that one. Let's just assume, so, you know, let's just posit the idea of somebody who is actually trying to live this out consistently. They would fail literally before they ever began. <laughs> Because they'd never prove anything. Um, I, I find that pretty fun. So, anyway, um, 
I hope that you'll have found this interesting, or it will have been of some value or something like that. And, uh, yeah, so one life lesson. Be careful of informal fallacies, because uh, they, they often... Um, informal fallacies are often not fallacies, and uh, even when they are, they very often cover over something else which is not fallacious that may simply be, well, wrong. Um, or, you know, in the case of definitions, because, you know, like, uh, the No True Scotsman, popular one, is a fallacy of definitions, roughly. It is, is related to uh, defining a thing uselessly. You know, where a person has defined a thing in such a way that nobody gets included, but on the other hand, the definition they're using, they can't then use to construct any interesting sentences, because since nobody actually fits into it, there's nothing to say about them. So, you know, if, if a person claims that... Um, you know, like such and such a movement, pick whichever. Let, let's um, let's uh, say, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, the Society Against Hats, making one up. Okay, uh, that that uh, part of the nature of being in the Society of Against Hats is that you forswear all violence. So when somebody goes and hits somebody else to knock their hat off, well, he's not a real member. Okay, fine, fine, um, but. How can you tell who is and is not against violence? You now have a select a, an inclusion criteria, which can't actually be applied in practice. So you can I mean you can construct in some sense interesting sentences, but the problem is because you have a definition which is not actually a, a you know one for which you can actually tell whether or not it applies to anybody. You now have useless sentences because you can never tell whether you can apply them to anyone, because who knows who does and does not think that violence might, you know, be useful at some point in some circumstance for knocking off a hat. Because, I mean, you can say, no, I, I, I think that violence is always wrong. But, you know, as life has generally shown, there are always exceptions to that. It's kind of the nature of being in, in you know, physical creatures that occupy the same, you know, reality, you know, same sort of time space is that occasionally we'll come into conflict. And, um, and a, uh, a strict dedication to never, ever using force means that you've essentially just given up. Um, so, the, uh, the, moreover, we're just combative creatures. And so, by and large, most pacifists, there are a few exceptions, um, the, the Amish, so far as I know, tend to live out pacifism better than, than most. Um, although, what it would be like if, if the Amish were pacifist in the face of you know, say, people like the Nazis, I don't know so much. I actually give them the benefit of the doubt, by the way. For, from the Amish, the few Amish people I've met, I think they, they actually are, are so dedicated and train themselves so well. Um, plus, there's a certain amount of, of, of selection criteria because people who don't leave. Self-selection criteria. Um, I actually think they probably would be even in the face of extermination camps and so on. But that being said, you never do know about people. And so since you never know whether or not people are actually for swearing violence, you never can tell whether or not somebody is, in that sense, a true member of the League Against Hats, or whether they are only, you know, a, a, um, a putative member of the League Against Hats, but really, in their heart, they actually would knock a hat off if they could figure out some way of getting away with it. So that sort of is the problem that you face with, with that sort of thing, um... You know, like the burn of proof. I'm sorry, the, the, the true Scotsman fallacy. It's not really saying that a person is not a true member of the group, because all groups have fake members, or at least most groups will, will tend to have fake members. Um, you know, people who think there is some benefit to appearing to be in the group, but not really, at which point, you know, they're not really in it. It happens all the time. It's so, in fact, common that to say... You know, that to rule out people who claim to be a member of the group as not, you know, being a true member of the group is just to, you know, exclude yourself from sort of ordinary human discourse. Because that, that's, it happens all the time. It's kind of important. Um, and it's important to recognize, you know, the, the something rather in name only. Um, you know, if you had a group of pacifists who were agitating for war, well, sorry, they're not really pacifists. Um, so, you know, when people, you know, if, if a person was trying to claim, well, not all pacifists are against war, you know, and somebody says, well, yeah, kind of are by definition. If they're against war, they're not a pacifist. If you shout no true Scotsman fallacy, you're just being an idiot. 
Um, so that, that's the thing about all the informal fallacies, is that they require a great deal of wisdom to know when to apply them. And moreover, they're so specific as to whether or not, you know, something is or is not, um, you know, because most of an argument in general made by human beings is unstated, um, that if you, you know, actually flesh out what is the unstated portions, um, most most things, like, you have to get so far into them and get so much into the specifics that there's no point in having much of a label for it. Because you can only ever know whether or not to apply these labels. Um, you know, things like like the ad hominem and so on. You know, uh, as I gave the example in the, my um, video about ad hominems, if a person says, you know, I did such and such as a child and I turned out okay... It's not an ad hominem argument to point out they didn't turn out okay. They're using that as an argument. And so the only possible way to contradict their argument is to say something negative about them. You're not, you know, attacking the man in lieu of his argument. You're actually attacking the argument in that case. Um, so, as you see in all, log all informal logical fallacies, the real problem you have is that you have to talk about the specifics. Just just using if if you just use the the label, all that happens immediately afterwards is that you start arguing the specifics of it. So there's no real benefit to having the argument. Uh, I'm sorry, having the label. Um, so I, that's the thing about these. Um, as as a uh, you know. I don't like the informal fallacies, by and large. I mean, they sometimes have cute names. I, I do at some point want to have the project where I rename all fallacies uh, in terms of Scotsman-based fallacies. Um, so, you know, the the um, you know the ad hominem becomes the ad scotus. The, um, you know, um, the no true Scotsman fallacy, the all true Scotsman fallacy. That, that's a person who applies the no true Scotsman fallacy to places where it doesn't apply. You know, that they're essentially claiming that everyone everywhere is a Scotsman, even people who were bo you know, born in France to French parents and have never so much as heard the name Scotland. Um, you know, uh, things like the... Um, um, oh, uh, sorry. Um, things like uh, um, yeah, the ad hominem, uh, you know, a non sequitur um, uh, could be... Um, you know, it could be the uh, no Scotsman, for example, um, or the Scotsman doesn't follow. Uh, you know, you can do things like that. I had a bunch of great, uh, great ones whose names are escaping me at the moment. It's, it's important to write things down. Anyhow, um, yeah, I, I, I do. I'd love to, to rename all of the informal fallacies um, after Scotsman. I think it'd just be a lot of fun. Um, but you know, the name is, I think, actually most of the value to it, and the fun in the name is most of the value to it. Um, Outside of logic, well, not really logic class, but outside of like a rhetoric and argumentation class, uh, where it'd be helpful to have a name just for a basic sort of pattern of how not to do things. Um, but aside from that, it provides no real value, I think. So, anyway, okay, I apologize. This is getting really rambly. So, uh, until next time, may you hit everything you aim at. Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Hi, I'm going to talk about the burden of proof again. Um, I got a comment in my, my previous video about the burden of proof, uh, which said that, okay, the burden of proof is not a law of logic, but it is a logical fallacy. And, um, uh, no it isn't. Um, and I'm not going to belabor this, because I, I don't think it needs to be belabored, especially after you know, the points I made you know, the, the more important points I made in my previous video. But I'm going to talk about this a little bit just because I find this idea so funny. And I hope you will too. Okay, so I pulled up yourlogicalfallacyis.com and uh, went, went to the burden of proof page there. So I'm going to read this to you. Um, and uh, so, so piece by piece. Okay, so the burden of proof. So, so their, their summary is, you said that the burden of proof lies not with the person making the claim, but with someone else to disprove. <clears throat> and, and I will say, uh, so far, that um, this is actually criticizing somebody invoking a burden of proof. Now, as I mentioned, just, just for summary, the thing is, there is not, as a general rule in life, such thing as a burden of proof that necessarily falls on somebody. The burden of proof, really, what it's trying to get at is the fact that if you can't force somebody to do something, you have to persuade them to. 
Um, so if you want somebody to believe something for some reason, and you can't make them, then you have to persuade them to it. And that's true. Uh, on the other hand, it has nothing to do with what is true, or even especially what can be known to be true. Um, which is what logical fall- I mean, well, okay, so there are two types of logical fallacies, really quickly. Formal fallacies, which are form- um, fallacies of inference. That is to say, they are forms of reasoning that simply don't work. Like the fallacy of affirming the consequent. P implies Q, Q, therefore P. Uh, to give a, a simple example, if Socrates is a bull, then Socrates has feet. Socrates has feet, therefore Socrates is a bull doesn't work. It, and it, the form of it doesn't work. It can't work. It doesn't... Now, uh, because something is a fallacy, it does not mean the conclusion is false. It just means that you can't get from those premises to that conclusion. Um, now, the other type are informal fallacies, which aren't fallacious reasoning. They are... Well, there isn't a really great definition of them. They are basically things that at least sometimes are not true. In formal logic, they're basically valid arguments which have premises that are at least fairly often false. You, um, so in the burden of proof, right, um, if you say that uh, the burden of proof lies not with the person making the claim, but with someone else to disprove. Now, a really simple example. Take anybody who, who drones on about the burden of proof. You know, how you've got the burden of proof, I don't have it. Okay, fine. Then, you know, ask them, you know, does France exist? And they say yes. And then you say, prove it. And they won't. They never do. They'll just say you're an idiot. I've done this a bunch of times. It's pretty much reliable. They never prove this. I mean, you can, as, as my friend Eve likes to point out, if you just use the principle of retortion, that is to say, applying a philosophical principle to itself, the person just claimed that you have the burden of proof. Well, according to their principle, they have to prove this now. And, and she goes and invites people, and then they call her idiots. It, it's um, it's amazingly predictable how this goes. Uh, uh, and I think I'm recovering old ground, covering old ground that I already covered. But you know, then there are people who.